Well, I'm starting on this series. I'm, well, actually, I'm completing this series here uh, that I've been doing, uh, and I've been doing both the Bible study and then also the the sermon as well. But you know, I've been doing a seven-part series from Proverbs chapter six, verses sixteen through nineteen, which talks about seven characteristics that God hates. And then, of course, in the sermon, in a, an hour from now. I'll be covering seven characteristics God loves, and then, as you know, I take those from the opposite of what God listed here. So that way we cover it, try to give it some depth, and try to cover it from both angles, from both, both views. Uh, the fact that God hates something, that should be very important to us to understand what he hates, and then more importantly, why he hates something, that we try to do that, and then, of course, later on, try to figure out what he loves, and try to figure out then why he loves something. So let's talk about sowing discord. The seventh one, God hates sowing the sowing of discord. Let's turn over to Revelation chapter 12, verse 4. Revelation chapter 12, verse 4. As is our tradition on these studies, when we talk about something that uh, God hates, we, we're quick to see and easy to find scriptures in the Bible that show that Satan the devil imitates this. He, he reflects this type of behavior. It's very simple to see of those seven things listed. You can go through the Bible with a concordance. You can look up many, many places that show that he patterned this bad behavior. And, of course, when we get to the, new, the things that God loves, Jesus Christ patterned and reflected the good behavior. And that is one of the great messages of the Scripture. So it comes as no surprise that Satan exhibits the seven bad characteristics, and Satan has exhibited the trait of sowing discord. Now, Revelation chapter 12, verse 4, shows again what he, what he had done. This doesn't give all the details here, but it shows that he had an impact on the angels. He had an impact on the spiritual realm. Verse 1 says, Now a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the, with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head a garland of twelve stars. Then being with child, she cried out, in labor and in pain to give birth. And another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great and fiery red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns and seven diadems on the, on the heads. Verse 4, his tail, the dragon's tail, drew a third of the stars of the heaven and threw them to the earth. The dragon stood before the woman who was ready to give birth to devour her child as soon as it was born. So we see very quickly that the dragon, whoever this dragon is, and of course we believe, I believe the different words for the dragon, the adversary, the devil, are all typifying the same negative being. And this dragon pulled a third of the stars, meaning that he, had, he was a negative influence on some of the angelic host. He was a negative influence on, pe on some of the angels instead of having their relationship with God. They no longer had that relationship with God, but they ended up falling away from God, and they were cast down to the earth. And so again, I believe the dragon was a negative influence. I believe from the scripture that everyone needs to take account for his own, their own decisions in their own life. I believe that the Garden of Eden pictures that, and I believe many places in the book of Jude talks that, that we need to take responsibility for our decisions. We need to take responsibility for our actions, but we do influence each other. Now, by that I mean is when I do something wrong, I can't blame you. I, I, you, I can't blame you if, something, if I do something wrong. You, you can be a good influence on me, or you can be a bad influence on me, but I can't blame you. But we can turn that around the same way. When you do something wrong, you can't blame me, and you can't blame the rest of us. We, are, we want to be positive influences, and even like my role is teaching in a congregation. My role of giving a Bible study and then also my role of giving sermons, I want to be a positive influence on people. And that's why you want to do the same thing. You want to be a positive influence on people. You want to be trying to create a, a good environment. But each person has to take their own responsibility. So I believe the third of the stars who fell, they have to take accountability for their own decisions. They have to take accountability for their own sins. But the dragon was a negative influence. And one thing about being a, an influence, 
A negative influence sows, can sow discord, and a positive influence can sow peace and unity. And that's what we're trying to contrast here. Let's go to Ephesians chapter 2, verses 2 and 3. Again, there are many scriptures. In fact, it's interesting for all seven of these negative traits, you can use the same scriptures over and over again. Because the, the, the scriptures about Satan apply to all the seven traits. But Ephesians 2, verses 2 and 3, let's try to look at some of the traits here in this segment that talk about, again, this, this, the sowing of discord. Ephesians 2, verses 2 and 3 talks about the adversary, talks about the dragon. Well, verse 1, it says, And you he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins. We've earned the death penalty, so we've, you know, we've been, we were dead in trespasses and sin. And the plan of God gives us life. The plan of God gives us salvation. The plan of life frees us. And, of course, that's we want to understand the plan of God. We want to appreciate the plan of God. We want to live the plan of God. We want to live in, in accordance with that freedom, accepting that freedom and taking on the responsibilities to reflect the great God of the universe. But he, in times past, we once walked according to the course of this world. Now, we're not totally free from the influence of Satan the devil, we're not totally free from his negative influence. He can still influence us. And that's our fault if we let it happen. It's really tough because with the more media we have, the more technology we have, there's good news and bad news to that. More technology means more good things can happen, but more technology, technology means more bad things can happen as well. And so the Internet can be a wonderful tool, but it can be a horrible curse when... Uh, 60%, 70, some say 70% of people who use the Internet go to the evil parts of the Internet. And so it, it can be a wonderful tool. It can, be, it can be a horrible temptation influencing people to make such bad, bad decisions. But in time past, we walked according to the prince of the power of the air. He can still be a bad influence on us. And we every day want to ask that he not be that bad influence on us. But we hopefully... Uh, most of our bad decisions, we were, when we were suckered in and swamped by him in the past, hopefully that was just something that we're, we're coming out of. But the prince of the power of the air is a spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience. He works in the children of disobedience. We were talking in the interactive Bible study, and I really appreciate the comments made. When we talk about sowing discord, we ask, why do people sow discord? Well, I'll get to that here in just a minute. Why do people sow discord? And someone answered correctly, sometimes people sow discord to be mean and cruel. But we also made this point that's also true. Sometimes people sow discord because they think they're doing God's service. Now, sometimes people sow discord because they really want to be cruel. And other times people sow discord because they... They're just confused of what God wants for them, and their, their motive may be good, but the results are not that good. But again, so God, the sons of disobedience, that's working from Satan the devil. Among whom also we once conducted ourselves in the lust of our flesh. And we still have to battle the lust of the flesh, but hopefully we're not consumed with it like we may have been in times past. In times past, we fulfilled the desires of the flesh, we fulfill the desires of the mind. Hopefully we're coming out of that. Through the power of God, we're coming out of that. He's leading us out of that. Maybe we've made, baptism made a huge jump out of that, but also we have to stay on top of that to make sure that we're still completely coming out of that. And it says, and we were by nature children of wrath, just as others. And of course, anger is a huge problem. There's a lot of reasons to be angry. You know, there, there's sometimes very valid reasons to be angry, but how do we do, you know, the Bible says be angry but sin not. So we certainly have to look at how we deal with anger and how we, we don't let anger control us, but we can let it be something that can be a positive thing, but it's very dangerous, the anger. So anyway, let's go, let's go to the question, why do people sow discord? Let's look at Matthew chapter 22. Why do people sow discord? Matthew chapter 22 Verses 36 through 40. And this is what I was referring to just a, a minute or so ago. 
Again, we asked the question in the interactive Bible study, why do people sow discord? And, and someone correctly answered, some people do it just to be mean. They do it out of revenge. They do it out of honoriness. Some people sow discord that way. However, sometimes, as I said, some people sow discord because they have other factors involved in their life. And he, let, let's look at, you know this, this famous account, Matthew 22, verses 36 through 40. When they were testing the Christ, and this, this final test, was a lawyer came up and asked the question, what is the great commandment in the law? And Jesus said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. The second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. This is not complicated what I'm about to quote here, but it's very important. Sometimes the most, com the most simple things can be the most compelling. They're not always easy to do, but a, a truth is, and a fact is, if we have a good relationship with God, we're going to treat our neighbor better. If we, have a, if we have a, the better our relationship with God, the less we'll be sowing discord in anyone's life. The more we have that relationship with him, the, the better we'll treat our neighbor. Let's look at Matthew chapter, across the page in chapter 23. We'll begin in verse 8. See, what happens is, when people hurt other people, it's because we ourselves are hurt. A lot of times the anger issue, remember we, we read from Ephesians 2, 3 about we were by nature children of wrath. Unresolved anger issues oftentimes lead to us hurting other people. And so until we get that relationship with God it's as strong as it should be and growing and growing and growing, we have a tendency to take it out on other people. Oh, we take it out on ourselves too, but we certainly take it out on other people. Let's look at Matthew 23, verse 8. Jesus is here correcting the Pharisees. And again, you know Jesus had a relationship ministry first. He did not have a warning ministry first. He fed them. He healed them. He cast demons out of them. And by the way, I recommend that be your ministry. I, re I recommend you have a relationship ministry. I know some people, not so much in our congregation, uh, our, our friend Mr. Webb, he liked to have a warning ministry. Well, Mr. Webb liked to... When Mr. Webb would attend here, and again, hopefully he wants some DVDs, so I hope he'll hear this. But when he, when he, would, he would attend here, he would come up to me, and he, he wanted to call up the Sunday preachers on TV and preach at them. He just wanted to do that so badly. And the issue he really wanted to talk about was three days and three nights. That really, he said, why can't they see that? Why can't they see it? it's three literal days and three literal nights? And I would talk to him about it, and he'd be like... I'd recommend he not call up and argue with them. I said, but you're free to do as you want. If that's what you want to do, that's up to you. But I, I, don't, I wouldn't worry about it. I, 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 I tell me. Then he would like, to, well, you don't believe in three days. You don't believe that what they think. I said, no, no, I, don't, I believe what you think, Mr. Webb. I'm just saying, why would you want to go argue with them about it? But if you want to argue with them, that would be your business. I think he'd love coming here because he would talk to us about it and Hopefully, if he would talk to me about it every Sabbath, then it would be less likely to call them up and talk to them, which I could provide a service. And one of my services was to hear him complain about that so he wouldn't beat up that old minister he was going to talk to. But that was up to him. I, I recommend a relationship ministry. Not because you're afraid. I recommend a relationship ministry because when the time's right to warn, you can be just like Christ and you can warn. And quite frankly, when, you, when the time's right, if you, have a, if you build up relationships, there's a good chance you, they might even, might even listen to something you say. You never know as you plant seeds. But anyway, they did not have a relationship ministry here, the, the Pharisees. They had a very judgmental ministry. And as you know, I'm not a big fan of religion because I believe much of religion is judging each other. I believe much of religion is getting a list of things you have to do and then, the, and then you, you, know, you strive for that, that's good, but then, uh, then people beat other people over the head who don't live up to that list, who don't live up to the preordained, more important things. So anyway, these, in, these religious people, these religious people said, but you, 
Do not call someone a rabbi, for one is your teacher, the Christ. Okay, what happened is people set up a system where people are considered special teachers. And those special teachers then view themselves too importantly. It was brought up in the interactive study. It was brought up correctly. The part of the reason why people sow discord is a lot of times when people are caught up on an idea, a real strong idea, and then that idea gets attacked, then the person starts defending the idea so much, they're no longer really responding to the person. They're not really responding to what's the best way to reach them, what's the best way to present this idea, what's the best way to help them. They're now defending. And I, uh, Bruce brought that up as a real good point. The people then start arguing over things because they, the, the, they feel they have to defend. They feel like, okay, I, my idea was attacked. Now, the idea, the truth, the idea may be truth, and the idea may be worthwhile to support, but anytime we start defending something, then again, we're, we're losing control, you know. And, and Dorothy brought up about how we need to have patience and asking God to help guide us our emotions, how to guide our responses when we want to follow God's way of responding rather than an emotional response. But see, what happens is sometimes if you're talking to someone who's the teacher, well, you can't question the teacher. That's the way it is in many places. That's not the way it should be. Any, any of us who give presentations, people are free to come up and talk to us about our presentations. People are free to discuss, to disagree about our presentation. That's, that's not viewed, in this congregation, that's not viewed as sowing discord. I know if you go to some congregations, if you, if you disagree with the, the pastor, that can be viewed as sowing discord. Now, by the way, I'm going to make the comment that later on, but I'll make it now too. One of the huge problems of sowing discord is the tongue, of course, which is a reflection of the heart. But there's a big difference. The example I used in the Bible study was, if, and I, I'm going to pick on her again, because she, she took it so well. But if I said, if I told you Colleen Atterbury robbed a bank, if I told you she robbed a bank, and what's it, let's say it's true. Now, uh, Dixon brought up, he said, well, maybe you are hallucinating. So he was defending her. <laughs> but I said, what if I know she, I saw my, I saw firsthand she robbed, I know she robbed the bank. Why would I have to tell everyone about that? It's true. And that, that might be completely true, but what so many people do, they have part truth, half truth. And we were talking in the interactive study, with communication so big, Facebook, texting, cell phones, instant communication. I mean, I, I tell this story before, this is how long ago it's been brewing. I remember one day I was flying, and as soon as we landed, we all turned on our cell phones, and everyone started buzzing that Tim Tebow was traded. That was the biggest news of the day. Tim Tebow was traded. I don't know, it must have been five years ago, maybe more, longer ago than that. Tim Tebow, it was like, oh. And instead of waiting till you got home to hear the sports or to home to get the radio or home to get a TV, we all, had inst we all had instant communication. I mean, you know right away when Donald Trump does a bad tweet. You know it right away. What's his bad tweet of the day? You can find it out immediately. And then you can find out what crazy thing Maxine Waters is going to say. You can know that. You can know those things immediately. I mean, it's, it's always there. So, you know, and I'm just picked. I picked on both sides. So I did that both sides because all, all, or just all saying crazy things. But unfortunately, the tongue is a huge problem because people talk instead of instead of instead of working it out with the person instead of doing it the biblical way. People don't. Well, anyway, the teachers, they are the ones promoting this superiority. Superiority. But he said, don't be calling someone teacher. For Christ and you are all brethren. You are all, we are all brethren. And again, a lot of times we call it first among equals. First among equals, there's certain people, you know, when it comes to piano playing, the first people in the congregation are Dixon, B, Helen, Karina. They're the first 
among equals. He's equal with us, but he, when it comes to piano playing, he's first. And it goes on, there's, we all have gifts and talents. And so there's no Superman, there's no superhero. And of course, the, the, the systems of superheroes oftentimes quotes Sow's Discord. Because if if in, in the old systems, if you challenge the superhero, you got yourself in big trouble. But that, that doesn't happen today. We don't have that today. Do not call anyone on earth your father, for one is your father, and he's in heaven. Do not be called teachers, for one is your teacher, and that is the Christ. He who is greatest among you shall be your servant. And whoever exalts himself will be abased, and he who humbles himself shall be exalted. One of the biggest problems of sowing discord is people think too highly of themselves. Now notice verse 13, the problem was, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, for you shut up the kingdom of heaven against men. For you neither go in yourselves, nor do you allow others to enter in. Some people like to be doorkeepers to the kingdom. I mean, they, some people overtly advertise their doorkeepers to the kingdom. They're not my doorkeeper. I will not accept that. But some people, by the way, don't overtly advertise it. They just try to sneak it in. And they're actually more dangerous. Because the ones who overtly advertise their doorkeepers to the kingdom, you see through that in a heartbeat. But those who act like they're the doorkeepers, they can, they can fool people sometimes. Verse 15, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, for you, tra you travel land and sea to win one proselyte. And when he is one, you make him twice as much a son of hell as yourselves. People sow discord by trying to control other people. By intervening in people's lives where they shouldn't intervene. That, that's, that sows a lot of discord. Because again, we talk about that idea that was brought up. If so, if and Dixon brought up correctly in the study. <laughs> For some people, sowing discord means you have a pet doctrine. You have a pet belief. Well, the Bible, is, the way the Bible talked about heresy is different than how people translate it today. The way the Bible talked about heresy is people creating factions. And most of the factions come not by what is believed, by how people deal with it. You can, you, can you can sow discord about how you chew bubble gum. In other words, pe people can fight over the issue of how to chew bubble gum. People can fight about what color tie should you wear. I remember when I first I started attending a church God years ago, uh, I came to church with a tie on as a teenager, and it was a paisley tie. And I walked in, and one of the men, he wasn't trying to be rude, he, he probably thought he was doing God's service. He told me that Paisley tie was bad. I said, why? He said, because the, the, those Paisley symbols are sex symbols. It's kind of like the old joke about the guy who was talking to a psychiatrist. The psychiatrist would draw something, and the patient would say, uh, what, what is that picture? And he'd say, that's a woman's body. The psychiatrist would draw something else. He goes, what's that picture? The patient would say, that's a woman's body. He'd draw something else and he'd say, what's that picture? He goes, that's a woman's body. And the psychiatrist says, sir, you have a problem. He goes, me? You're the one drawing all the dirty pictures of the woman's body. And that's the way it was with my paisley tie. He, that man, it was sex symbols. I looked, to this day, I, of course, I, I gave up the tie, you know, trying to be agreeable. Didn't want to wear, didn't want to wear a tie that caused the fence. But in his mind, that was, that was a problem. Why did he have to even bring that up? First of all, it wasn't true. Second of all, if it was true, I mean, thankfully, as a teenager, I, oh, I'm sure my brother and I may have mocked him privately. You know, We probably mocked him and made fun. Oh, I guess I'm kind of mocking it today. I'm talking about Paisley Ties today. So. But I mean, why do, we have to, why do we have to feel like we have to be the doorkeeper for other people? People being the doorkeeper of other people sows more discord than you can ever believe. People being the doorkeeper. John 16, verse 2. John 16, verse 2. Remember I mentioned here about sometimes people can be cruel on purpose. But John 16, 2 says, Jesus telling them after, right before he's dying, during the Passover night, 
They will put you out of the synagogues. Yes, the time is coming that whosoever kills you will think that he offers God service. I submit to you, and I believe, that most of the sowing of discord is not by people trying to do bad things to you. Most of the sowing discord is people doing things which they think are in the name of God. They've got to correct the way you observe the Sabbath. They've got to correct the way what you listen to. They've got to correct the way how you view the news. They've got to correct the way how you do the politics. They're trying to do you God's service. They're trying to help you. They're trying to serve you. They're trying to benefit you. And realizing that just because their motive is right doesn't make it edifying doesn't make it productive. I won't turn to Luke 18, verses 9 through 14. Again, that's Luke 18, verses 9 through 14. That's the parable about the Pharisee and the publican, Pharisee and the tax collector. Remember the problem, though? The problem was they trusted in themselves and they hated other people. Again, I'm going back to the the two great commandments. The more you trust in yourself the more you're going to hate other people. The more you trust in yourself, the more you're going to sow discord. The more you trust in God, the more you're going to love your neighbor. The more you trust in God, the more you're going to love your neighbor. We're talking about the why here. Now let's look at, I have some examples on the handout. I've got about seven more minutes to go. I have some examples on the handout about people who sow discord. Let's go to Genesis chapter 27. Genesis chapter 27. This shows that women have, can do it just as much as a man can do it. This is Rebecca. Rebecca sowing discord. We see in verses 1 through 4 that Isaac wanted to bless Esau. He wanted to bless Esau. Verse 2. Behold, now I'm old, and I don't know the day of my death. Now, therefore, please take your weapons, your quiver, and your bow, and go out to the field and hunt game for me. And make me savory food, such as the food I love. Get, bring that meat home. I love it. Bring it to me that I may eat it, that your soul may bless, that my soul may bless you before I die. Okay, good plan. Dad wants to bless his son. The problem was in verse 5, Rebecca was listening. Mama was listening. So when Isaac spoke to Esau, his son, and Esau went to the field to hunt game and to bring it. And Rebecca went to Jacob, her son, and said, Listen, I heard what your father said to Esau. I know what's on his mind. I know what he wants to do. So I want you to bring game. We're going to make savory food for me that I may eat it. Uh, He talked about, bring it and I'll eat it. Now therefore, my son, bring us, as I command you, go to the flock, bring from me two choice kids of the goats, and I will make savory food from them for your father, such as he loves. And when he comes, we'll think, we'll pretend it's your Esau, and I'll produce the food, and you, my son Jacob, you will get the blessing. This is sowing discord. So discord happens. Anyone can sow discord. Sometimes dad sow discord. In this case, mom sow discord. Sometimes, sometimes mom sow discords in a way that sometimes it's obvious. Again, I don't, this was kind of probably done in secret. They didn't know much about it, but now we all know about it. It's in the books. But sometimes I know dads or moms who privately sow discord And other people don't know about it. And sometimes you try to help them. And sometimes the people who don't have all the facts get the wrong impression. And when they get the wrong impression, and they talk, especially when they talk, boy, that that can cause a lot of discord. And sometimes the mom can make it sound real convincing. And sometimes the mom can talk about, and all of a sudden you you only hear such a tiny bit of a story and have no clue what's really going on. Rebecca couldn't have gotten away with it. Someone said, 
Did you hear this? And see, Esau got upset. So can you imagine someone saying, did you hear how upset Esau got? Yeah, Esau got upset. Because mom was doing something that maybe at first no one knew about until it was finally posted in all the Bible. <coughs> Here's just one example. Acts chapter 8, Simon the sorcerer. He sows discord. Acts 8, verses 9 through 11. There was a certain man called Simon who previously practiced sorcery in the city and astonished the people of Samaria, claiming that he was someone great. Getting back to this vanity thing again. To whom they all give heed, this man is the great power of God. Well, they heeded him because they were astonished by his sorceries. Well, he got baptized, which again proves that not everyone who's put in water actually gets really baptized. Not everyone who has the laying on of hands really receives the Holy Spirit. I mean, it's not really our place to question it, but the point is, uh, we, we just see their examples. You know, he got baptized, and, and maybe, he, maybe he did receive the Holy Spirit, but we know he, if he did receive the Holy Spirit, he made a huge mistake. Look at verse 18. When he saw the laying on of hands, now Simon saw that through the laying on of the apostles' hands, the Holy Spirit was given, he offered them money. Give me the power also that anyone who I lay hands on will receive the Holy Spirit. And, of course, a huge problem in religion is money, power, and control. It's always a huge problem in religion. Money, power, and control. What's the old expression, follow the money? Follow the money? Again, unfortunately, he, he was rich. He was charismatic. He knew how to reach people. But unfortunately, it wasn't really his heart. It really wasn't what God saw inside. And he, his problem was he, was he was wanting to sow discord. He was wanting to use his funds to sow discord. Acts chapter 13. Another sorcerer. Acts 13, verse 8. Elimus, the sorcerer. He was in the town there. And finally, Saul said, verse 10. O oh, fool of all deceit and all fraud, you son of the devil, you enemy of all righteousness, will you not cease perverting the straight ways of the Lord? And sowing discord is oftentimes claiming to be godly and even claiming to have and revealing you have parts of God's truth, but you might be perverting parts of God's truth. Because, again, the biggest damage is not a, a, an obvious lie everyone knows. The biggest problem is a little bit of truth mixed with lies. Or a lot of truth mixed with lies. Because you can take truth, you can take an, an honest situation, and you can sprinkle in a little lies in there, and you can pervert the straight ways of the Lord, and that sows discord. So if I, if I tell you, if I, were to, if I were trying to cause you trouble, <coughs> or you were trying to cause me trouble, if you and I told the, the biggest whopper in the world, that wouldn't fool anybody. No, if you want to cause the biggest, if you want to cause the most trouble, you try to tidbits of truth and sprinkle it in with some dust of lies, and that's really caused most trouble. And that's what this guy was doing. And then Saul said, what are you doing? When are you going to stop doing this? When are you going to stop talking, talking this way and doing this way? Well, I'm running out of time, so I'll just mention the last two on the example. And I've only given you these. I've given you Rebecca and Simon the sorcerer, Elimus the sorcerer. But also in the Bible, in 2 Timothy 4, there's Alexander the coppersmith. Alexander the coppersmith sowed discord. And so that's why even Timothy, Paul mentioned it to Timothy in one of his last letters and just mentioned about this guy caused me a lot of damage, this guy caused me a lot of trouble, and... Uh, Beware of him. And so again, uh, he, Timothy was trying to, uh, Paul was trying to warn about this guy. And another guy, fellow in 3 John, verses 9 and 10, is Diotrephes. Diotrephes, what, what was his problem? He loved the preeminence. He loved the chief seats. But he would kick people out of the church. Now, they weren't really kicked out of the church of God, but they were kicked out of the assembly where they were meeting. And he used, he used malicious words. He would spread lies. 
Again, what's the, what's the big problem? We're sowing discord. Well, the bad heart produces bad words. A malicious heart produces malicious words. And that was happening with Diotrephes. He loved the preeminence, so he would use his preeminence to try to put down others. And it worked. Well, it worked, but John called him out for it. And John said, when I, John actually said in John, 3 John 9 and 10, when I get there, we're going we're gonna to talk. We're going to talk about this. Because by the way, brethren and friends, the best thing to do is instead of talking to other people, talk to the person you have an issue with. If that were done, well, if that were done by everybody, we, we, who, who, there would be no, no big problem in the church of God. Trust in the fact that it won't be done by most people. Trust in the fact that it will be done against you and just make sure you don't follow suit to do what other, other, when other people are doing bad things, don't follow suit and do those bad things. Anyway, I've taken my time here, but I wanted to give you an example of the seventh thing God hates. And the seventh thing he hates is that of sowing discord. We try to look to see that our relationship with God will affect how we deal with other people. So I ask you to be close to God so you can truly love your neighbor. If you'll bow your head, we'll ask God's conclusion. Our Father, our loving God in heaven, we appreciate the chance to look at your scripture, taking a lot of time to go as fast as we can through different parts of the Bible, these big subjects. We scratch the surface, Father, hopefully inspiring people who hear this to do their own studies, to see the truth that your scripture outlines. We try to understand this negative aspect because since you hate it, we don't want to be doing it. And Father, we want to, in the sermon time, look at the positive side of it then, that we can see that what you love, so we can focus on the stick and the carrot both, that we can be realizing the, the warnings against something and also the alluring of, of a better way to live. So we ask your dismissal, and we ask your blessing on our fellowship. We look forward to coming back in a short amount of time, and we give you thanks in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.